Excellent. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next talk. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Regine Eckert. Uh, she's a PhD student in the Computational Imaging Lab with uh, Professor Laura Waller at uh, California Berkeley. Uh, her interests are broad, but include computational imaging systems for high resolution and high dimensional microscopy. Uh, she has a plethora of uh, applications and uh, interests outside of uh, her research as well. Uh, I happen to go to her website, uh, encourage others to also visit her website, and it seems that she's an excellent photographer as well, uh, in addition to being a, a microscopist and computational imaging uh, scientist. So Regina, please, uh, please take it away. All right, thank you so much. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Regina Eckert, and I'm gonna be talking to you, to, to you today about measurement diversity for 3D refractive index microscopy. Uh, before I kind of dive into uh, 3D refractive index, I just want to talk more generally about imaging. Uh, so in imaging, our goal is to understand something in the world uh, that we're measuring, right? Uh, so in microscopy, this is usually something scientific. So for example, we might want to know uh, what type of cell is this? What's its structure? Uh, but when we're imaging anything, uh, we're really seeing that there's some light moving through some scene uh, that we can measure at, on some kind of camera system. Um, and then we're having some computational system that's asking, what exactly am I seeing? How can I actually understand this and use this in the world? Uh, so for 3D refractive index, we're reconstructing some type of uh, 3D RI volume here. But I think something that we're all really interested in asking is how can I actually make this problem work better? Um, and I think what we've all really seen is that in order to do this, we do have to consider both sides of the equation here. We have to understand how can we optimize both our optics and our computation together uh, to make a better computational imaging system. But this is like a really hard problem, right? Uh, there's uh, a lot of different design considerations, both on the optics side, where we're asking things like, are the optics actually physically possible? Are they cost effective? Are they robust and usable? And then on the computation side, we're asking things like, is it fast? Is it accurate? Is it actually easy to use? Uh, so this is actually really difficult. We can't just like throw these systems into some big machine learning algorithm and tell it to spit, us, spit out, like, how do I actually measure these things best? Um, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more specifically uh, about a question that I've been asking uh, for 3D refractive index, which is how can I increase my system's measurement diversity? Uh, so I'll kind of get to exactly what I mean by that in a little bit, uh, but for now, we're gonna dive into 3D refractive index imaging. Uh, so uh, in this kind of imaging domain, we're using the native contrast of some micros uh, some really small organism uh, to reconstruct its structure. Uh, so refractive index, just as a, as a reminder, is uh, describes how a material changes the speed of light and it also controls uh, the bending of that light in transparent objects. Uh, so here I have this volume where I have this 3D cell cl cluster. And there's different properties that have different refractive indices. So uh, the cell background versus the nucleus versus different organelles all are going to have different refractive index values. But it's really hard to image this uh, because these things are really small, they're transparent, we can't actually directly measure this refractive index value, uh, value and we're trying to get 3D measurements from 2D images. Uh, so it's a really difficult imaging problem. All right, so that's the problem. Why do we even want to do this? You might be asking, well, like, what, what's the point? Um, so there's actually a range of medical imaging uh, applications for 3D refractive index, uh, one of which is organoid development, so taking stem cells and understanding how they uh, structure themselves into organs. Uh, but, you know, humans are just a part of a much bigger picture. Uh, another application here is actually uh, calculating improved scattering models for how light scatters in things like phytoplankton or snow algae uh, to help understand and better model climate systems. All right, that's the application space here. So let's talk about how we actually approach this problem. All right, so I have my object, uh, it's this 3D refractive index volume that I'm gonna call X. And I better put some light through this uh, system, right? I need to be able to measure something. Uh, and I should probably use coherent light because phase is related to how refractive index delays light. Uh, 
then I can model the scattering of this light through my object by this operator S. Uh, and since I said these things are small, we better you know, use some type of things that to blow up the image so we can actually measure it. Uh, so we're going to use a, a, a microscope objective, uh, which is going to have some point spread function that we can multiply. And then, of course, we can measure it our camera. But unfortunately, we can only measure an amplitude. We can't measure the actual phase of this. All right. So then we can use this equation that we've built up uh, and formulate it as an optimization problem to solve it. So here we're having this kind of modeled thing of our uh, how the light moves through our objects. Uh, and we're comparing it to what we've actually measured at the, the camera sensor in order to reconstruct some estimate of our volume X. So cool, we solved it, great. Ooh, we can, we can go home now. Not really, right? Uh, this is a, a really complex uh, reconstruction that I talked about. We can't actually just use one image to solve it. Uh, you can kind of think about it's a really dense volume. Uh, it's a 3D volume, and we're just measuring 2D information. Uh, so you can think about, you know, you just really need a lot more information through the system in order to reconstruct all of that information that we're trying to get out. All right. So how have people attacked this? Uh, so previous methods uh, have used a changing illumination angle uh, to get 3D and phase information out of this object. Uh, so you can kind of think about this as holding your illumination constant and having different views of the same object. Uh, people have also used a change in focus. So again, you can think about having 3D information because you're defocusing the information in your scene. Uh, finally, people have used rotation of the object. So this is really similar to CT scanning, uh, where you're just rotating the object and therefore getting 3D information about it. So the question that I've been asking is, how can I best measure this data to reconstruct refractive index? Uh, and here I'm taking best to mean most accurately, most robustly, uh, and then the easiest, fastest, and kind of least data intensive way. So uh, the kind of conclusion to this, just as a preview, uh, is the uh, system that I've kind of come up with combines two of these previous methods. Uh, where I'm going to both change the illumination angle and introduce pupil coding uh, at a Fourier plane in order to uh, do this imaging process. Uh, so I'll be talking about that. And then at the end, I will also talk very, very briefly about how we can learn better pupil coding designs using machine learning. All right. So to dive into this system, uh, this is kind of the proposed optical uh, optical system that we're going to use. Uh, so we have uh, an angle scanning mirror that's going to scan a coherent beam through our sample, uh, which we're going to image with an objective, which is then going to relay the uh, pupil plane of the objective to a phase spatial light modulator. So we're going to be modulating the conjugate for a transform plane uh, of this system. And then we detect it a camera. All right. So what we're going to do here is at each different angle of illumination, we're going to apply a random phase mask. Uh, and we can think about doing this for actually a lot of different modulation, modulation bases because we have some pixelated SLM that we can randomly code to do whatever we want to do, right? So one easy way of thinking about this is doing some defocus kernel. Uh, so that would be really similar to just directly combining previous methods where we're doing the angle scanning and the defocus scanning. However, we could also just do random pixels uh, and see if that works. Or we could do something like a random coefficient on a zero key basis. Now, uh, actually, I've seen uh, through this work that all of these different bases work fairly well and fairly similar to each other. So I'm just going to be talking about the zoning key bases here uh, to make some of the, the next slides a little bit easier to look at. All right. So uh, what I've seen in this work uh, is that including this pupil coding in the system increases our measurement diversity. And so here I'm defining measurement diversity to be uh, having more diverse information content collected across my measurements. So we can see this by looking at some simulated measurements. Uh, so here I have this cell cluster phantom that we were looking at before. Uh, and I'm looking at the no pupil coding case here, so the kind of original diffraction tomography case where we're just changing the angle of illumination. And down the column, we're going to have a different angle of illumination for each measurement. So you can see that there's some information here. Uh, some of the cells that are out of focus are kind of moving around as the angle scans. But generally, these don't look that different by eye. However, when we introduce this pupil coding element, we can see that we get really a lot more contrast across these images. 
And so we can just think about having just different information in these, uh, in these uh, images, which is kind of apparent to us visually uh, by having this higher contrast. All right. So we reconstruct uh, with that same optimization algorithm I showed before. Uh, I'll, I'll unpack some of these different terms here. So we have our data consistency penalty, where we're having our system model uh, that includes the information about our angled illumination, our multiple size forward model, which is the scattering through the object, the objective pupil, and now this random pupil coding that we're applying. Uh, and that's going to compare to the actual measurements that we get out of our system. We can also apply a prior penalty that can say things like, I think that my system, my, my object's going to be purely real uh, or smooth in some way, things like that to, to make this work a lot better. Uh, and then we're going to reconstruct some estimated volume X uh, that explains the measurements that we have. All right. So what we've seen in this system is that actually given all time and all data to compute, uh, both of these methods converge fairly well. So here we're having all of our illumination angles up to the NA of our objective that we're using to measure. Uh, and so when we compare these, recon uh, these reconstructions to the ground truth, uh, we can see that both of them have fairly good reconstruction of the cell background. So this low spatial frequency, which corresponds to the RI values, is recovered fairly well. Uh, however, what we've seen uh, in previous work is that this pupil coding makes the system more robust uh, to limited illumination angles, limited computation time, and also increased background noise. But I'm going to focus on limited illumination angles here because that actually makes our system that we're using a lot easier to use if we can, if we can have limited illumination angles. So here, uh, we're looking at this original illumination angles that go up to the NA of the objective. Uh, and now we're going to cut down uh, to a much lower NA uh, of our maximum NA of our illumination angle, uh, which corresponds to a 43% in our data also. Uh, and here we can see these reconstructions again. So what you're seeing here uh, is that uh, the Zernike coding reconstruction looks fairly the same uh, as our previous result. However, uh, in the no pupil coding case, which is uh, kind of what our old system looks like, this cell background value uh, is not reconstructed very well. So that's really cool because uh, we're actually like getting more information encoded into these fewer measurements uh, when we include this pupil coding. Uh, and we see that in experiment, this is also uh, what happens. So we have this 3D uh, refractive index phantom. Uh, and we can see that with less uh, illumination angles, uh, with the coding, we are getting those background values uh, much better, just visually looking at them. Uh, and that this is true also for uh, lower, even lower uh, numbers of images. All right. So you might be wondering why, why exactly does that work? I've talked about measurement diversity, but what's the mechanism here? Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the, the math here exactly, but uh, what we've done is taken some transfer function analysis, and we've seen that this pupil coding has actually a better low spatial frequency weighting in our measurement system. Uh, so we can see here on the left the original illumination case, uh, and all of these kind of systems are getting more information in that low spatial frequency, so near zero. But when we limit the illumination down, the no coding doesn't have very much weight in those low spatial frequencies and therefore can't reconstruct it very easily. Uh, and digging into this a little bit more, we've seen that this is caused by having diverse pupil coding, which couples varied phase information, not the same phase information, into our intensity measurements to make this uh, reconstruction easier. Uh, all right. So just kind of taking a little bit of a broader picture away from this. I just talked a lot about some specifics for my system, but uh, I just want to say that measurement diversity, uh, which I've seen is useful in my system, is also important across computational imaging systems. Uh, so you might have already been kind of thinking this, right? Uh, there's uh, some stuff from the 80s where phase diversity is used for doing wavefront sensing. Uh, there's also compressed sensing, obviously, where you have some incoherent sensing matrix uh, that can reduce the measurements that you need for sparse signals. You can also think about having diverse data for machine learning, right? Where we need a wide range of examples in our data sets to have good results. So this isn't something that's just uh, you know, applicable for sparse systems or just applicable for non-convex systems. Uh, it's something that actually spans uh, across all of these imaging systems and therefore is very useful to think about. 
So I've talked about this kind of uh, new proposed system for doing 3D refractive index imaging. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly, uh, as time permits, about how we can learn better pupil coding designs for the system. So uh, as I'm sure you've all seen, uh, we can take this optimization algorithm that I've talked about previously, and we can represent it as a network by just unrolling every gradient step in our algorithm and treating it as a layer in a neural network. And the benefit to this is that we can then compute some loss com uh, compared to ground truth, and then back propagate that loss to update some parameter about our network, uh, which can represent something in our system. Uh, so here, we're learning pupil coding from this unrolled network uh, kind of system. So we have our learnable pupil coding over here on the left, uh, which is input to our network, and is used to create all of the images that go into each of these iterations. Then we use this to kind of reconstruct a volume, uh, which is then compared to a ground truth volume. And that loss is backpropagated through the network to update our learnable pupil coding and then update our images. Uh, and then we've constrained uh, our system here to only have this limited illumination angle case uh, to uh, do this reconstruction. So that's kind of how we've thought about this. I won't go into the, the details too much because I don't think I, I have time, but uh, if you're curious and want to want to ask later, or email me, uh, let me know. All right. So with that, I've introduced uh, this new uh, combination of illumination and pupil coding for 3D refractive index tomography. Uh, I've talked about how we might learn better pupil coding designs using machine learning. Uh, and all of this has been in service of doing better imaging uh, for a wide range of different applications. Uh, before I conclude, finally, I just want to kind of you know, bring it back to what everyone else is working on, not just microscopy, but across all imaging systems, and just kind of urge you to think, you know, when you're next thinking about how you can jointly design your optical system, can you ask, how can I increase uh, my system's measurement diversity uh, to kind of make this system work better? Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my group uh, and ask for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, great talk, Regina. I'm going to start with the first question from Yen Wei which is, what if the data reduction came from randomly sampling elimination angles instead of limiting the angle? How would that affect the reconstruction? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so uh, you could do that. And definitely, actually, if you just like limit your illumination angles to be the larger uh, illumination angles, then you actually wouldn't get as much improvement with the pupil coding as what I've shown, uh, where you limit down to the lower NA. But the kind of benefit of doing this lower NA illumination is that you can actually uh, reduce the complexity of the system design for doing the angled illumination. Because uh, that can actually be like a really complicated part of doing this uh, when you're going to high resolution uh, systems that need like really high angles. Uh, so doing it where you're actually like limiting down to the, the least extreme angles makes the system design a lot easier. Terrific. So there are a couple more questions. I'm going to pick one that seems a little uh, quicker to answer. So uh, Yun Hao has asked, by using coherent illumination, will there be speckles? And if yes, how would one potentially get rid of this? Yes. Uh, so uh, yes, <laughs> and that can be a big problem. Uh, so what we actually do is uh, I align with a laser, uh, but then we put in a collimated LED uh, that is fairly coherent, but not so coherent that you get speckled from every single optical surface. Uh, so yes, very good question. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Regina, for that talk. Uh, and there's one more question in the chat from a postdoc at Princeton, that uh, same one, Bach, that, uh, that you can uh, potentially address there. Thank you again for uh, giving the time today.